Here's an, an interesting article entitled Scant Search for the Maker. And it is authored by Alan H. Linton, who is a professor of bacteriology at the University of Bristol. In it, he states, But where is the experimental evidence? None exists in the literature claiming that one species has been shown to evolve into another. Bacteria, the simplest form of independent life, are ideal for this kind of study, with generation times of 20 to 30 minutes and populations achieved after 18 hours. But throughout 150 years of the science of bacteriology, there is no evidence that one species of bacteria has changed into another, in spite of the fact that populations have been exposed to potent chemical and physical mutagens, and that, uniquely, bacteria possess extra chromosomal transmissible plasmids. Since there is no evidence for species changes between the simplest forms of unicellular life, it is not surprising that there is no evidence for evolution from prokaryotic to eukaryotic cells, let alone throughout the whole array of higher multicellular organisms. Let's take a bit closer look at Professor Linton's claim that there, there is no evidence for species changes between the simplest forms of unicellular life. How about the opposited example of poor neo-Darwinian evolution of antibiotic resistant bacteria? Well, this following short video investigates antibiotic resistant bacteria and finds that that evidence falls short as to being true evidence for Darwinian evolution. In a sense, this is evolution, but it doesn't go anywhere near far enough to really provide evidence for Darwin's theory. For centuries before Darwin, domestic breeders were well aware that they could produce dramatic changes in existing species. And in the case of antibiotic resistance in bacteria, that's all we're doing, or all we're seeing. We're seeing changes within existing species. In fact, just recently, uh, a renowned British bacteriologist said that in 150 years of research, uh, although you might expect new species to appear in bacteria before they would appear anywhere else because bacteria reproduce so rapidly, in 150 years, we have seen no new species emerge in bacteria. Well, what Darwin's theory needs is those new species. Antibiotic resistance in terms of natural selection is an excellent example when it's used. I mean, it's one of the, one of the um, hallmark examples given in, in microevolution for support of Darwinian thought. However, I think in the, in the last few years, it's got to be reinterpreted to a degree. Laboratory research shows that when an antibiotic is applied to literally billions of bacteria cells in a petri dish, a few mutated cells that happen to be resistant to that drug remain. Those few cells can then give rise to a colony of resistant bacteria. The question is, how well does this mutant strain survive in the long run? This can be measured in what scientists call fitness cost. How well does this mutant bacteria survive when the drug is removed and it now must compete with the original parent bacteria? These organisms are not able to grow with the fidelity, the robustness that the original parent did. And that's one of the things that we've been looking at. So you can take a culture of cells that are, that are sensitive to the drug, play them out on petri dishes that have the drug, but there's a single colony coming up that's resistant to the drug. One cell that gave rise to this colony was resistant to the drug out of four billion. If this is the parental strain, we now have a mutant, we grow them up separately, and then we 
put them in the same test tube without the drug. So now we've removed selection and we can measure empirically the fitness cost in terms of how well the resistant organism can now compete with its parent. The surprising result is that in a relatively short period of time, the resistant bacteria lose out in their competition with the parent. They can't reproduce as fast and over a short time disappear. Within one or two transfers of overnights, you can lose that population of resistant cells. And then after the third transfer, the resistant isolate has been completely outcompeted by the parent. Why is the resistant strain ultimately less fit? One answer may be that the mutation that produces antibiotic resistance also damages the cell's ability to copy genetic information. It turns out that the resistance strain has a defect in its information processing system. So, these bacteria gain resistance to the antibiotic only by losing another key function they need for survival. That's why in the wild the resistant strain would lose out to the parent type because the resistant strain is actually less efficient overall. We're going backwards in terms of the fitness of these organisms, not forwards, as used as an example of evolution. But defenders of Darwin's theory say that's not the whole story. They point out that new mutations can occur in resistant bacteria that will allow them to recover some of their fitness. These new mutations are known as compensatory mutations. Over time, interestingly, you can find compensatory mutations to increase the, the growth rate. So second mutations occur to build the organism back to where it was, but they never get back there completely. According to Minnick, compensatory mutations damage the resistant bacteria in still other ways, again reducing their overall fitness. So you get locked into this genetic condition that never allows you to recover what you lost initially in exposure to that drug. The end result is that antibiotic resistance seems to be a dead end for Darwin's theory. It can't generate the types of complex changes needed for macro evolution to occur. This site has a list of the degraded molecular abilities of antibiotic resistant bacteria. In the article it states, all known examples of antibiotic resistance via mutation are inconsistent with the genetic requirements of evolution. These mutations result in the loss of pre-existing cellular systems activities. And here is a screenshot from the site that gives the list of the degraded molecular abilities of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Moreover, the mutations that lead to antibiotic resistant bacteria are not random, but are found to be induced mutations. This site states, research has demonstrated antibiotics themselves induce mutations leading to antibiotic resistant bacteria. Moreover, these following studies showed antibiotic resistant bacteria, contrary to Darwinian thought, to be ancient. This the first study showed it to be eight centuries before the invention of the first therapeutic antibiotics. And the second study have found that resistance has been around for at least 30,000 years. In the following study, we find antibiotic resistant bacteria cut off from the outside world for more than 4 million years have been found in a deep cave. The authors comment, our study shows that antibiotic resistance is hardwired into bacteria. It could be billions of years old, but we have only been trying to understand it for the last 70 years. Along that same line, this study on 250 million year old bacteria states that Almost without exception, bacteria isolated from ancient material have proven to closely resemble modern bacteria at both the morphological and molecular levels. 
I wondered if a fitness test had ever been performed between the ancient bacteria and modern day bacteria. So I wrote an email to Dr. Cano. Dr. Cano commented on the fitness test that I had asked him about and stated that ancient isolate was capable of utilizing a broader, broader scope of substrates. The profiles were similar but more diverse in the ancient amber isolate. Thus, the most solid evidence available for the most ancient DNA scientists are able to find does not support evolution happening on the molecular level of bacteria. In, a, in fact, according to the fitness test of Dr. Cano, the change witnessed in bacteria conforms to the exact opposite, genetic entropy, a loss of functional information and or complexity. In the following article, the author comments, after comparing data from throughout the world, researchers have concluded that modern pond scum differs little from ancient blue-greens. The similarity in morphology is widespread among fossils of varying times. And he quotes up to a billion year old fossils. The following study found that the mats woven of tiny microbes we see today covering tidal flats were also present as life was beginning on Earth. And they quote a 3.48 billion year old fossil find as evidence. Here is an, an amusing video clip from an interview Richard Dawkins had with Dr. Randolph Ness, who is a advocate of quote unquote Darwinian medicine. And I am amazed, Richard, that what we call metazoans, multi-celled organisms, have actually been able to evolve. And the reason is that bacteria and viruses replicate so quickly, a few hours sometimes they can reproduce themselves, that they can evolve very, very quickly. And we're stuck with 20 years at least, or around between generations. How is it that we can resist infection when they can evolve so quickly to find ways around our defenses? The entire video is really quite amusing and you can see a more uh, detailed response and analysis of the video. But I would like to focus in on that quote that I highlighted in that video clip. Or to draw out the principle behind what Dr. Ness is saying. If evolution by natural selection were actually the truth about how all life came to be on earth then the only life that would be around would be extremely small organisms with the highest replication rate and with the most mutational firepower since only they since they greatly outclass multicellular organisms in terms of reproductive success would be the fittest to survive in the dog eat dog world where blind pitiless evolution rules and only the fittest are allowed to survive. In other words, since successful reproduction is all that really matters on a neo-Darwinian view of things, how can anything but successful reproduction be realistically selected for? Any other function besides reproduction, such as sight, hearing, thinking, etc., would be highly superfluous to the primary criteria of successfully reproducing and should, on a Darwinian view, be discarded as so much as excess baggage since it would, sooner or later, slow down successful reproduction. Moreover, the Darwinian precept that the world is dominated by competition is uh, completely wrong. In this article, researchers state, 
When we saw the results, we said, this can't be. We sat there banging our heads against the wall. Darwin's hypothesis has been with us for so long. How can it not be right? Darwin was obsessed with competition, Cardinal said. He, was, he, he assumed the whole world was composed of species competing with each other. But we found that one third of the species of algae we studied actually like each other. They don't grow as well unless you put them with another species. In fact, instead of eating us, microbes are essential for us to live. In the listed article, we have microbes, microbes inhabit just about every part of the human body, living on the skin, in the gut, and up the nose. Sometimes they cause sickness, but most of the time, microorganisms live in harmony with their human hosts, providing vital functions essential for human survival. In the second article we have, we often associate bacteria with disease ca causing germs and pathogens, but I am convinced that the number of beneficial microbes, even very necessary microbes, is much, much greater than the number of pathogens. In fact, there's evidence that uh, pathogenic uh, viruses and diseases are caused by a loss of functional information and complexity. In this article we find, we commonly think bacteria must gain genes to allow them to become pathogens. However, we now know that the loss of genes and the streamlining of the pathogen's metabolic capabilities are key features in the evolution of these disease-causing bacteria. In a survey of laboratory evolution experiments with microbes going back four decades, Michael Behe found that of course, we had already known that the great majority of mutations that have a visible effect on an organism are de deleterious. Now, surprisingly, it seems that even the great majority of helpful mutations degrade the genome to a greater or lesser extent. I would like to close this video out with a quote from Michael Behe from a video that he made after his work on studying HIV and malaria was confirmed in the laboratory. He stated, this is not an argument anymore that Darwinism cannot make complex functional systems. It is an observation that it does not and I'll leave you guys with this uh, Richard Feynman quote. Now I'm going to discuss how we would look for a new law. In general, we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess it. <laughs> then we compute... Well, don't laugh. That's what's really true. Then we compute the consequences of the guess to see what, if this is right, if this law that we guess is right, we see what it would imply. And then we compare those computation results to nature, or we say compared to experiment or experience, compare it directly with observation to see if it, if it works. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. In that simple statement is the key to science. It doesn't make a difference how beautiful your guess is. It doesn't make a difference how smart you are who made the guess or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it.